Okay, uh, good morning everyone again to uh, new and returning uh, members of Journal Club. Uh, welcome August uh, 2022. We have two exciting presentations this morning on what might be lost in translation, one on language concordance and care and the other on interpretation of pain. First, the land acknowledgement. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the land upon which the work of the University of Toronto's Department of Medicine is conducted. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Mississauga, the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, this land is home to many diverse First Nations, Inui and Métis peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and gather on these territories. Land acknowledgements are only a starting point for larger conversations. More concrete acts of restitution and transformation are needed to address underlying inequities and blatant discrimination in the distribution of resources between Canada's First Peoples and settlers. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Ramiz Imtiaz, PGY5 resident, will present on patient physician language concordance and quality and safety outcomes among frail home care recipient, recipients admitted to hospital in Ontario, Canada. Ramiz, uh, please unmute and go ahead. I think I'm already uh, unmuted and I am ready to go. Uh, so good morning, everyone. It's nice to meet all of you. Uh, I think Dr. Bandal already mentioned the title of the study that I will be presenting. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, this is just a brief overview of what I will be covering uh, over the course of this uh, presentation. Um, so I think it's uh, probably no surprise to most of you who are on this call that older adults are more likely to have medical complexity and multimorbidity, and they're more likely to also have communication problems, be it um, sensory or in some cases expressive. Um, it's also been shown across uh, different healthcare settings that older adults are more likely to experience harm because of poor patient provider communication. Um, and people in North America as a whole, whose primary language is not English, have poorer healthcare outcomes, including access to healthcare, and receive healthcare services of lower quality and safety. And the unfortunate end result of that is that there is a higher risk of adverse events, particularly uh, increased healthcare resource use uh, with uh, people whose primary language is not English. The second outcome there, the increased healthcare resource use, was actually shown here at Toronto, um, a UHN including Toronto General, Toronto Western, and Princess Margaret Hospital in a study that was completed in 2003, uh, in which both Dr. Gary Nagley and Dr. Shabir Alibi were a part of, but essentially it showed that patients with limited English proficiency uh, that were admitted to uh, UHN had longer hospital stays for some medical and surgical uh, conditions. Um, in Canada, we have a, a unique situation in in that approximately about a quarter of our population, so around 6.1 million Canadians, live in a situation in which their primary language is not spoken by most of the population that is around them. The two biggest groups are Francophones who live outside of Quebec and Anglophones who live in Quebec. And then we're also home to obviously uh, many immigrants who may be in that situation as well. Um, the majority of the literature in language concordance care, uh, particularly in the healthcare setting, is in the primary care setting. And the two big populations where it has been shown to make a significant difference is uh, individuals who have asthma, as well as individuals who have diabetes. And their outcomes are, are certainly better when they receive language concordant care. So the objective of this study, um, this was essentially a population-based retrospective cohort study in Ontario. And the objective was to compare the risk of adverse hospital-related outcomes among frail patients living in Ontario after stratifying them into patient language and patient physician language concordance or discordance. The way that they did this is they did this through the ICES framework. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, this is essentially a data repository which links uh, data anonymously across multiple different databases. Um, and the two important databases that they used for this study, I mean, they used five in total, but the two most important one was the Resident Assessment Instrument Home Care, which is essentially the home care assessment um, that all residents in Ontario get if they get public uh, home care. Uh, 
And this includes both the primary language of the patient, as well as an overview of their comorbidities. Um, the other important database they used was the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario database, which includes the language of physicians in Ontario. And also their OHIP database uh, records all physician billing claims, which can then be used to link to uh, patient encounters uh, to make uh, judgments on if they were receiving uh, language concordant or discordant care. Um, in terms of how they came to their uh, eventual cohort, they started with all patients who received a home care assessment between April 1st, 2010 to March 31st, 2018. They then excluded patients that were outside of Ontario, were not eligible for OHIP, were less than 18 or older than 105 years old. And they uh, importantly excluded patients who had two or less um, uh, uh, sorry, less than two uh, comorbidities. Patients who had two or more comorbidities um, were then excluded if they did not have at least one hospital admission within 12 months of their initial home care assessment. Finally, um, they then took that subsequent cohort. They excluded any patients who, in which they could not identify who their physician was during the hospital encounter. And importantly, they excluded any patients who did not speak English, French, or at least one of the top 10 language groups. Language groups were made based on uh, mutually intelligible languages. For, for example, if you spoke Hindi, Urdu, or Punjabi, you were felt to have uh, spoken a linguistic language that fell into the Indo-Aryan group, and you were included uh, in the study. But if you were outside of the top 10 languages groups, then you were then excluded. Um, and then finally, uh, they excluded patients in which they could not um, link uh, the, the patient encounter to at least 50% of days billed by physicians. And particularly, those physicians must have had a language uh, uh, that was affiliated uh, with their CPSO profile. Um, and so patients who received at least 50% of their care by a physician who spoke a language uh, that was their primary language were deemed to have received language concordant care uh, or otherwise received uh, language discordant care. And their final cohort was about 200,000 uh, patients. Uh, just to give some framework, so this is from uh, Statistics uh, Canada. In Ontario, we have uh, two large uh, uh, French speaking areas. The first is uh, close to Ottawa, includes the communities of Hawkesbury, uh, as well as some surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and typically this all falls into the Champlain uh, uh, region. The other region that we have is simply referred to as the North, and this includes uh, more rural communities such as uh, Timmins, uh, Hearst, uh, and so forth. Uh, approximately 33% of the population in Ontario, so about one third, reports a primary language that is other than English. And the other important thing to know is that in Ontario, we have the French Language Services Act, which mandates that a small number of government agencies uh, provide all their services in both English and French. Why that's relevant is that this includes 12 hospitals, four of which are in the Champlain region, and then uh, eight of which are in the Northern Ontario uh, region. So the first set of results is essentially a table of the characteristics of the cohort that they identified. You'll see that there's Anglophone, Francophones, and Allophones. So Allophones are patients who do not speak English, French, but rather one of the top 10 languages. Uh, and keeping in mind, this is not a randomized control study, so they don't need to be um, necessarily equal across their uh, different uh, uh, population groups. But I think it made for some interesting results, which I'd like to review. So the first thing they found that in general, allophones tended to be older and more likely to be married. Uh, Anglophones tended to have a higher level of education and vice versa, Francophones had a lower level uh, of education. Francophones, I, and I hope you guys can appreciate that from the map that I showed, were more likely to live in rural areas and reside in lower uh, income neighborhoods. Um, vice versa, Anglophones were more likely to have a higher uh, income quintal. Allophones uh, were more likely, uh, I think for obvious reasons, were more likely to have immigrated uh, to Canada. About a quarter of them had immigrated uh, to Canada. Um, allophones were also more likely to have functional limitations. This was shown both on basic ADL scale as well as the IADL scale, particularly great difficulty in all IADLs. Uh, 
Um, and maybe not surprisingly then, allophones were also more likely to have higher rates of cognitive impairment, particularly in the moderate severe impairment and uh, higher. Uh, and finally, um, uh, francophones are more likely to have health instability. This was done to the use of the CHESS score, which is a, uh, a research tool, but it is um, used typically in home care assessments. And they use that to measure health instability and uh, francophones are more likely to have moderate to high health instability, uh, despite not having as high functional limitations or cognitive uh, impairment as allophones. Um, so the, the, the bottom line result is that if you were anglophone you were, and you received health care in Ontario, you were felt to have language concordant care. But if you were francophone, about 44.4% were treated primarily by a French speaking physician and only 1.6% of allophones received most of their care from a physician who spoke a language that was mutually intelligible to their uh, primary language. And that was utilized to then make uh, uh, results or uh, judgments on certain outcomes. So the first graph is in hospital outcomes. And so what this shows is um, uh, both francophones and allophones. And essentially the comparator is francophones and allophones who had language concordant care to francophones and allophones who receive language discordant care respectively. Um, the way to read this graph is if you fall under one, that is a, not a statistically significant result. If it was less than one, there's a decreased risk. And if you're greater than one, there is an increased risk. Um, essentially, uh, they found that um, francophones and allophones who receive language concordant care were uh, likely to have reduced harm, length of hospital stay and death, the result was more profound in the francophone group compared to the allophone group. And that was uh, felt that um, if you were francophone, you were more likely to still be able to speak English, especially if you live in Ontario compared to allophone. Um, and the other point that I'll make on this graph is it's important to keep in mind that we are comparing about 44.4% of francophones to about 56%. Uh, so 44% that spoke uh, that received language concordant care with about 56% that received language discordant care. Whereas for allophones, we're comparing about 1.6% that received language concordant care to 98.4% that received language discordant care. And so you'll see that uh, the, uh, the confidence intervals are bigger for, for allophones. In terms of 30-day post-discharge outcomes, um, unfortunately, there was no statistically significant difference amongst uh, francophones and allophones based on language concordant or discordant status uh, in terms of emergency department visits, hospital admissions, and deaths. So just to uh, review the results that I presented in the last two graphs, so allophones and francophones who received language concordant care had lower risk of adverse events during hospital admission, shorter stays in hospital, and lower risk of in-hospital death. Unfortunately, there was no statistically significant difference within 30 days of discharge, uh, including for return to emergency department readmissions and, and death. So why, why did uh, this result uh, occur? Well, I think the first uh, bullet point there is, is, is obvious um, in that um, there was enhanced physician-patient communication, and that can probably improve the diagnosis and accuracy of uh, physicians leading to reduced harm and may also reduce the number of unnecessary investigations re resulting in a reduced uh, length of hospital stay. Um, it can also be argued that um, in patients who uh, had language concordant care, they had in enhanced patient cooperation and engagement, which is associated with positive health outcomes, as well as uh, minimization of cultural differences. Now, language obviously doesn't always predict culture, but there is a possibility that that was uh, one of the factors as well. Um, in previous literature, it has been shown um, that patients who receive poor understanding of discharge instructions have an increased risk of return to the emergency department, uh, as well as readmission to a hospital, uh, which, which seems intuitive. Uh, but the authors of this study argue that this was mainly in younger adults. And in older adults, there may be certain factors um, that uh, uh, make those results not as significant. So for example, what the goals of care an individual is, uh, what their functional status at time of discharge is and how much support they have. And these factors may predict a higher return to the emergency department that are not necessarily being accounted for in this uh, study. 
In terms of some of the limitations, um, the home care assessment, uh, uh, initial assessment only records one primary language. And so if a person spoke French, but also German, for example, and received care from a German speaking physician, they would inaccurately be identified as having received language discordant care where they may have received language concordant care. The second point is, is that there's not enough information about physician patient encounter, particularly about um, uh, if there were other members of the healthcare uh, team that spoke uh, a similar language to the patient. And this is particularly relevant in academic centers where often residents are involved in direct patient care, um, as well as um, you know, NPs or PAs that are on the team that may be looking after the individual that speak uh, the same language as the patient. There might also be uh, other interdisciplinary team members who may be able to translate for the patient. So for example, nursing, social worker, and so the patient might be receiving language concordant care, but it's not being recorded as such. And finally, the quality of the data collection, so the home care assessment forms, may be impacted as most interviewers likely speak English. And so if they're uh, uh, inputting data from an individual who does not speak English, it might not be as accurate as if they were speaking to an individual who speaks English. For the critical appraisal of this study, because it was a cohort study, I chose to use the Newcastle Ottawa Quality Assessment Form. Um, this is essentially a assessment form that um, allows a judgment of quality on the basis of three criteria: the selection, comparability, and outcome. In each of these criteria, you receive a certain number of stars, and then that correlates with whether or not this was a good quality, fair, or poor quality study. So the first is the selection criteria, and this study does really well. It actually scores four stars, which is the highest that you can get on this group. And so the first question is the representativeness of the exposed cohort. The exposed cohort here is older adults who are frail receiving a home care assessment. And I would argue that this is somewhat representative um, just because these are uh, home care recipients who had at least one hospital admission within 12 months of their initial home care assessment. And so we may be dealing with a cohort that is more comorbid and more frail than just home care recipients alone. Um, the selection of the non-exposed cohort was drawn from the same community as the exposed cohort, which correlates to one star. And the ascertainment of exposure was done through secure records, so medical records, government census, and other official documents. And so that correlates with one star. And the demonstration that outcome of interest was not present at the start of the study uh, was, actually, was true just by virtue of the design of the study. You must have received your home care assessment and then had a hospital admission afterwards from which outcomes were drawn. And so that receives one star as well. The second is the comparability criteria. And the comparability of cohorts on the basis of design or analysis controlled for confounders was done both for age, sex, and marital status, as well as through uh, regression models was accounted for other factors that I shared with you, uh, such as income quintel and uh, um, uh, comorbidity uh, status as well. And finally, in terms of outcomes, uh, the assessment of outcome uh, was done through confirmation of outcome by reference to secure records, uh, as well as record linkage across the ICS framework. So that was one star. And the follow was the follow up long enough for outcome to occur. And I would argue, yes, all patients were followed for at least a minimum of 12 months to see if they were admitted to the hospital and uh, were followed 30 days following that, which is the norm, at least in my review of uh, when post-discharge outcomes are referred, they typically refer to 30 days post-discharge. And was the adequacy of follow-up cohorts, uh, uh, what was the adequacy of follow-up cohorts? So it was complete follow-up, uh, although there may be some caveats to that in uh, if a person receives a home care assessment, but then goes outside of Ontario or goes to Florida for the winter, et cetera, they could have had a hospital admission there that is not being accounted for in this study, uh, but ultimately it still receives a one star. So. When we look at it across the different criteria, this study falls under the good quality uh, in terms of its uh, critical appraisal. Uh, so these are my references, um, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions now. Thank you very much, Ramiz, for the excellent and clear uh, uh, presentation. Uh, as you mentioned in your limitations, uh, there was no way uh, to uh, determine if uh, any efforts were made to overcome the language discordance in terms of the methods, but I imagine all uh, members of the cohort or all participants in the, the, the cohort all had similar uh, efforts or on average similar yeah. uh, efforts. And perhaps the one question I would uh, pose to you, 
um, uh, what efforts do you uh, use uh, to try and overcome language discordance? And has this changed uh, the extent of your effort to overcome um, language discordance among the patients you care for? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think part of my efforts are sort of, uh, unfortunately, hospital hospital specific. I think some hospitals um, uh, do make it quite easy to have some type of translation services available. Uh, and so I'll definitely look to use that. Occasionally, there are family members or, uh, you know, especially in geriatric medicine where collateral is so important, uh, there are family members who can kind of assist in providing that collateral. And then certainly turning to my colleagues, so other members of the interdisciplinary, if there's a nurse or somebody else who speaks the same language, uh, I will, uh, if possible, try to involve them in the patient encounter so that I can then uh, have a more accurate um, uh, discussion with the patient. And I, I think, you know, this, this study kind of confirms what I, to me, I kind of already expected that if you're receiving language concordant care and you're involving the individual, you're obviously more likely to pick up on kind of what their understanding of their hospital encounter is, the things that they're experiencing, the main issues and the goals that, that are for them. Uh, but, it, but it does highlight the importance and it is uh, in some way uh, making an effort to show that uh, uh, there is a difference in outcomes, at least in hospital outcomes, uh, when we provide language concordant care. So it makes me more aware and it makes me more motivated uh, in future situations if I have a patient who doesn't speak a language that I can speak uh, to make that effort to pursue translation services. Thank you very much. It was also interesting to note that prior literature, if you had to focus those increased efforts at one point in time of care, prior literature would suggest that it's at discharge, but this yeah. uh, seemed to indicate that it was uh, in hospital that it was more significant. Yeah, 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 that, 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 that is a fair point. And that's where they, uh, they try to uh, kind of uh, make the call that maybe older adults have other factors that need to be thought about uh, when it comes to discharge as opposed to just their understanding of the discharge instructions alone. Thank you, we have time for one uh, more question. I'll open it to the audience. Please feel free to unmute, raise your hand, or enter into the chat box. We have no other uh, questions. Give it one more moment. I see many uh, community geriatricians online as well. Um, invite all those uh, joining from the community if you'd like to pose a question. Any differences, Ramiz, in region of Ontario? I'm sorry if I missed that. Uh, no, unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, uh, that was not a, a focus of this study, so they didn't break, break down in terms of region of Ontario. It was just Ontario whole. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Ramiz, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, for the interest of time, we will move on to Dr. Rachel uh, Johnston, PGY4 resident officially, but uh, with far greater experience, uh, will be uh, presenting on the effect of pain reprocessing therapy versus placebo and unusual care for patients with chronic back pain, a randomized clinical trial. Rachel, please feel free to share your slides and uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ramiz, for the great presentation and uh, to Dr. Gandell for the introduction. Today, I am presenting the effect of pain reprocessing therapy versus placebo and usual care for patients with chronic back pain, a randomized clinical trial. And this was published in JAMA Psychiatry in January of this year. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest, uh, but I will say that I became interested in this topic after Dr. Andrea Furlan, who's a physiatrist at TRI, gave us an academic half day a few months ago about pain. And at the end of it, it was a great half day. And at the end of it, she recommended this book, The Way Out, written by Dr. Alan Gordon. Um, and he's one of the authors of this paper. And so all of that got me quite interested in this topic, and I'm excited to present it with you today. The objectives are to update our current understanding of chronic pain, describe pain reprocessing therapy, critically appraise this trial, discuss implications in our patient population, and directions for future research. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think it would be helpful if we frame this in a case. So I want you to imagine a 75 year old man who lives alone, past medical history of dyslipidemia, depression, osteoarthritis, and degenerative disc disease, taking an ACE inhibitor, a statin, duloxetine, pregabalin, and Tylenol. And we'll say he's referred from his family physician for functional decline. And when he comes in, his priority is his back pain. So I don't know about members of the audience, but I know seems to me like I'm seeing a patient like this at least on a weekly basis and even more commonly if you include caregivers into the mix. Just some background so we're all on the same page. When I talk about chronic low back pain, I'm referring to pain, muscle tension, or stiffness in the low back for a period of at least three months or longer. And in the geriatric world, 21 to 68% of individuals over the age of 60 have had chronic low back pain within the last year. 80% of long-term care residents experience some form of chronic pain. We know that increased age is a risk factor for chronic pain. So this is a very, very prevalent problem in our patient population. In older adults, chronic pain leads to greater suffering, social isolation, disability, and greater costs and burden to healthcare systems. So we talked about the location of pain in the low back. We talked about the duration of three months or longer. And now we're gonna talk about different pain subtypes. There are four main subtypes. The first is nociceptive pain. And it's probably the first kind of pain that comes to mind uh, when I say the word. Here we're talking about a peripheral painful stimulus that stimulates our peripheral nerves up to the spinal cord, the thalamus, and onward to the cerebral cortex. So an example of back pain from nociception could be an acute spinal fracture or a flare of rheumatoid arthritis. The next type is neuropathic pain, and that's where the pain originates in a damaged neuron. So for back pain, that could be radiculopathy or multiple sclerosis. The third type that was new for me to learn about was nosoplastic pain, pain originating in the brain. Examples of that could be fibromyalgia or a remote peripheral injury that has since healed months or years later. And the last type is mixed pain that is some combination of number one, two, and three. Uh, I think it's a little bit controversial, but osteoarthritis could be uh, an example of mixed pain. At this point, I think it would be helpful to, for us to reconceptualize pain a little bit further, in particular, nosoplastic pain. So the authors um, of The Way Out and the authors of this paper, as well as Dr. Andrea Ferlin, um, have reconceptualized pain as analogous to a home security system. And there's a link at the bottom, if anyone's really interested, she has a very popular YouTube videos um, that outline this uh, in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> so if we consider in a home security system that we have these peripheral sensors that detect abnormal signals and in our body they would be picking up nociceptive signals. Those signals get transmitted via wires or in our body peripheral nerves to a relay station like the spinal cord and then upwards to a central dispatcher like our brain that interprets the signal as either a true threat of a break-in or a fire or a false alarm. And then the central dispatcher is supposed to act upon the alarm appropriately. So if it was a true threat, call the police, for example. But there can be false alarms. So if the wires are cut, then the alarm system is going to get triggered in the absence of any true threat. And that's where we might experience no, uh, neuroplast, neuropathic pain. Sorry. But what about when there are no peripheral signals at all? What about when the central dispatcher calls the police because it sees someone suspicious walking across the street? When the central dispatcher misfires, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about nosoplastic pain. So to summarize, the International Association for the Study of Pain updated their definition of nosoplastic pain in 2021 to define it as pain arising from altered nociception despite no tissue damage activating peripheral nociceptors and no disease of the somatosensory system causing pain. So the pain is not occurring in the periphery, the peripheral nerves or the spinal cord. <laughs> Where are we talking about in the brain? We're really getting at the limbic system, which includes the anterior cingulate cortex that you can see in turquoise in the diagram, the insula that you can see in pink, the amygdala in green that 
uh, can amplify our response to pain, and the hippocampus that's not shown that can inhibit pain. The thalamus and the hypothalamus, they're in blue, and the nucleocum nucleus accumbens that is not shown, as well as the prefrontal cortex that's not shown. Uh, we also have our somatosensory cortex, which of course is involved, and we think back to medical school, the homunculus that we all learned about. And then other important inputs are from the endocrine system, in particular, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access that regulates cortisol production and the immune system that regulates our mast cells. So I thought that was very interesting learning about nosoplastic pain, chronic pain, but what do we do about it? Uh, when I went back through the literature, there seemed to be a lot of uh, conflicting evidence. We have a Cochrane review saying one thing, a CMAJ guideline from 2017 saying something else, and a whole bunch of systematic reviews and RCTs saying everything in the middle. I, I found it very confusing. Luckily, in the UK, NICE came up with an updated guideline for chronic pain last year in 2021. They emphasize that the assessment of chronic pain should be holistic, and the mainstays of therapy are exercise, any modality, psychological therapies, in particular cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, as well as a single course of acupuncture. Importantly, they do not recommend analgesic medication and actually say that we should consider deprescribing analgesia for patients that are on it long term, but that antidepressants should be considered. Because I'm speaking to a room full of geriatricians, I, mean, um, I will outline cognitive behavioral therapy and remind us that it is a psychotherapy that aims to increase awareness of a patient's inaccurate or negative thinking so that they can respond to pain more effectively, and the emphasis is on behaviors. Acceptance and commitment therapy is more of a mindfulness-based approach that emphasizes a patient's psychological flexibility so that they can better accept pain. But the authors of this study thought that there was something fundamentally missing with both CBT and ACT in the management of chronic pain. And that is the pain fear cycle. They argue that the underlying etiology of nosoplastic pain is this pain fear cycle. We start out with a painful stimulus that triggers a fear of more pain, putting our body into a high alert state that heightens our sensitivity to pain in the future. It is exacerbated by learned associations. So for someone with chronic low back pain and they have pain when they sit, they may come to associate the sitting position with pain so that even the anticipation of sitting could trigger pain. And also, perhaps more controversially, non-contributory structural diagnoses like degenerative disc disease. And they argue that anyone, all of us in the audience, anyone older than an infant has some degree of degenerative changes in their spine, but only those in whom the pain fear cycle is activated experience pain from it. Overall, uh, they describe pain as a prediction about bodily harm and consider it like a warning signal that something is amiss in the body that needs to be attuned to. With that in mind, they developed pain reprocessing therapy. It's a novel psychotherapeutic intervention that was developed by uh, Dr. Alan Gordon and Alon Ziv. Uh, they based it on principles from cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure therapy for panic disorder. There are five main components to pain reprocessing therapy. First is patient education about the pain fear cycle. The second is gathering personalized evidence to support a diagnosis of nosoplastic pain. So that includes taking a history, a physical exam, reviewing any relevant imaging, and discussing it with the patient. So pain that occurred during a period of stress, that occurred without injury, when there's an inconsistent pattern of pain. So for someone with back pain, they're sitting during this you know, boring journal club presentation, they might have worse pain compared to when they're sitting and watching their favorite movie. And then also if there are different somatic symptoms at play, like irritable bowel syndrome or migraine, that can also point more towards a diagnosis of nosoplastic pain. The third component is really the crux of 
PRT, and that's what they call somatic tracking, which is a technique of pain reappraisal. And that includes mindfulness, safety reappraisal, and positive affect induction, which is just a fancy term for in instilling some humor into the therapy session. So I'll give you an example. The therapist might say something like, even though you're feeling a tight burning or tingling sensation, we know that it's safe. We've gathered a lot of evidence that your back is perfectly healthy. Your brain is simply misinterpreting the signals coming from your body as if they're dangerous. This is a safe sensation. It's just a gentle stretch. The fourth component is addressing other emotional threats really targeting that high alert state. Here, the therapist helps the patient to process emotions and trauma history using whatever psychotherapy technique is available and most appropriate for the patient. The last component is helping the patient to gravitate toward more positive feelings and sensations in general. They might teach techniques for self-compassion and gratitude to increase the patient's overall sense of safety in their day-to-day -day life. So with that in mind, after that overview of PRT, the authors asked, can a psychological treatment like pain reprocessing therapy provide durable relief by shifting a patient's beliefs about their pain? They got some money from the NIH and they looked at patients uh, in Boulder, Colorado from the age of 21 to 70 with chronic back pain. The intervention was pain reprocessing therapy and and that was delivered via a one-hour telehealth evaluation and then eight one-hour therapy sessions over a four-week period. They had two comparator arms. The first was an open-label placebo group, and that group got to watch two educational videos about the placebo response. They underwent a validating clinical encounter with a pain specialist, and then they received a subcutaneous saline injection. And they were told as they were receiving the injection that there was no analgesic medication in the injection. It was just saline. Uh, the second comparator group was usual care, and that group was just advised not to initiate any new treatments for their pain over the four-week study period. Their primary outcome was average pain at one month. For recruitment, they put out social media announcements, print and electronic announcements, and got referrals from local care providers. They excluded patients with mild or non-back pain, patients with a serious underlying medical cause like inflammation, malignancy, or cauda equina syndrome. And they also excluded patients that were less likely to comply with the study procedures, uh, patients that couldn't attend for therapy sessions or that had active psychosis, and patients that had radiographic CNS abnormalities pre-existing, like a prior stroke, brain surgery, or tumor, because they couldn't normalize their fMRI studies as planned. Importantly for us, they did not assess cognition. They randomized patients using a computer-generated model, and I thought it was very interesting because they uh, ran it as though there were two parallel trials. They first randomized patients one-to-one -one in a pain reprocessing therapy versus placebo, and a pain reprocessing, uh, sorry, a placebo versus usual care trial in one-to-one -one fashion. And then from there, they randomized them two-to-one -one into each arm so that they ended up with an equal number of patients in each arm uh, of the study each of the three arms. The reason they did that was because they wanted patients in the placebo arm to perceive that they were receiving an active treatment. Their primary outcome was average pain over the last week. They used the brief pain inventory short form that's been around for decades, widely used, it's been validated in low back pain with very good reliability, takes about five minutes to complete, and their primary outcome really hinged on question five, rate your average pain over the last week on a number scale from zero to 10, where 10 is pain as bad as you can imagine. They also looked at some secondary outcomes, particularly mood and affect with a focus on fear. They had a variety of uh, scales for that. They looked at function, substance use, and then the patient's general impression of change and treatment satisfaction. They also performed MRIs pre and post treatment, looking at spontaneous and evoked pain separately. For the statistical analysis, they used an intention to treat approach with a mixed effects model. They reported p-values and also a hedges g. 
which is a statistical measurement of effect size. So where a p-value tells us if the finding was significant or not, the hedges g tells us how big the effect size was. And when a hedges g is one, that indicates that the effect size is equivalent to one standard deviation. So that would be a very large effect clinically. Looking at their consort diagram, they started out with 1,321 patients that were assessed for online eligibility. 435 patients never attended for their follow-up in-person eligibility assessment. Um, they excluded some more patients because they had non-back pain or mild back pain, and they ended up with 151 patients randomized per that protocol to the three different arms. There were 50 in the PRT group. Of those, 45 initiated treatment, and all of them were monitored out to 12 months. The 12 month follow up rate um, was 90% of those randomized. In the placebo group, 84% were followed out to 12 months, and in the usual care arm, 72%. So, what I took away from this consort diagram is they were dealing with a very highly motivated patient population. And I think that is also seen in their table one. So there's a lot of details there. I'm just going to summarize it by describing a typical patient as a 40 year old white man or woman, college educated, employed with back pain for 10 years, four out of 10 severity, not on opiates, with some pain elsewhere in their body, generally physically active with minimal disability and moderate depression, anxiety, sleep, and anger scores. On my eye, generally the groups looked pretty evenly matched, but they didn't report p-values. Um, there might have been some more women in the pain reprocessing therapy group, the intervention arm, compared to the comparators. Now the exciting part, the results. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to graph A on the left that I outlined in red, showing uh, the difference in pain intensity. You can see that the average pain score in all three groups was four out of 10 at baseline. And then at post-treatment at four weeks, we see a significant reduction in pain in the PRT, the pain reprocessing therapy group in blue. So their pain came down to an average of 1.18. And you can see that that effect was pretty well sustained out to 12 months. In the placebo group, there was also a reduction of pain from four down to 2.84 that was pretty well sustained at 12 months. And in the usual care, there was also a drop from four down to 3.13 sustained at 12 months as well. Overall, the reduction in pain from the blue placebo group to the orange, uh, sorry, the blue PRT group to the orange placebo group was 1.79, and that was statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0.001, and a hedges G of 1.14, indicating more than one standard deviation effect. And the result was even more <laughs> significant in the PRT versus usual care group, where there was a drop of 2.4 in the average pain score, also significant with a P of less than 0 0.001 and a hedges G of 1.74. In graph B, we can see that there was a decrease um, in the percent change in pain intensity, most pronounced in the blue PRT group compared to the others. And in graph C, we can see that the proportion of patients reporting a pain-free or nearly pain-free, so a cure, uh, was highest in the blue PRT group compared to the others. And that effect was sustained reasonably well at, at 12 months. For their secondary outcomes, they saw that pain reprocessing therapy was associated with a decrease in both spontaneous and evoked pain scores. And there was also a decrease in disability and anger when you compared PRT to either of the two groups. And when you compared PRT just to usual care, they also saw significant improvements in sleep, increase in positive affect, and a decrease in depression. There was no difference in the groups uh, in substance use, and the PRT group did have a high treatment satisfaction reported. Looking at the fMRI studies, they saw a decrease in spontaneous and evoked pain activity on fMRI in the pain reprocessing therapy group 
comparing pre to post treatment, and an increase in connectivity in the limbic system on fMRI. And that goes back to the neuroanatomy slide that I showed um, a few minutes ago. So for the conclusion, the authors had asked, can a psychological treatment like pain reprocessing therapy shift a patient's beliefs about pain and provide durable relief from chronic back pain? And they conclude, yes, it can. Moving on to our critical appraisal, uh, specifically validity. Was the assignment of patients to treatment randomized? Yes, they used that computer-generated model with the two parallel trials. Were the groups similar at the start of the trial? They looked pretty similar. Uh, they didn't report p-values, though, uh, and they did not report any comorbidities, analgesic regimens, other somatic symptoms, or substance use, which I think would have been interesting to see. Aside from the allocated treatment, the groups seemed to be treated equally. Uh, all the patients who entered the trial were accounted for and analyzed into those groups following an intent to treat analysis, and the follow-up rate was pretty good at 12 months between 72 to 90%. The measures they used were objective. They used those validated questionnaires. And to ensure treatment fidelity, they had independent coders of the audio recorded uh, pain reprocessing therapy sessions to ensure that they followed the five uh, main components of PRT. And although patients were not kept uh, and clinicians were not kept blind to the treatment as per the study design, I thought they did have quite a thoughtful design of the open label placebo arm and the placebo versus usual care findings will be published uh, separately, they're forthcoming. For the results, they demonstrated a very large treatment effect greater than one standard deviation. They did not report a number needed to treat it because the outcome wasn't binary. And the measure was precise. There were narrow confidence intervals and they didn't report any adverse effects. So it all sounds great so far except for the applicability. Um, our patients in geriatrics are very different to those in this studies because they excluded patients over the age of 70 and they did not assess cognition. The treatment is not feasible in our setting because we don't have any pain reprocessing therapists. Although if anyone's interested, there are a couple of clinics uh, in the GTA that have um, you know, PRT or nociplastic informed physiotherapy care, but they're not covered by OHIP. Uh, so I don't think we can really answer if the potential benefits of the therapy outweigh the harms yet. So my bottom line is that pain reprocessing therapy does lead to a significant and durable reduction in chronic low back pain at one month and at one year among adults aged 21 to 70. But the results of the study should not be readily applied to adults over 70 or to patients with cognitive impairment. So you may be wondering why I chose to present this uh, paper that excluded older adults to a group of geriatricians. But I think there's a lot that we can learn from it. In the neuroscience world, we're learning that chronic pain is associated with accelerated cognitive decline. We know that in dementia, there may be an altered perception of pain and certainly uh, can affect our ability to communicate pain. Also, we're learning about uh, pain and aging. Uh, with normal aging, there is a decrease in the effectiveness of those descending pain inhibitory mechanisms in the brain and in the spinal cord. We have reduced endogenous opioid activity with normal aging. Meanwhile, there's a reduced sensitivity of peripheral nociceptors to pain. Putting that together, in normal aging, there may be a decrease in peripheral nociception, but an increased risk of nosoplastic pain. So how will this study impact my practice? Well, I'm not going to go out and order PRT for a patient tomorrow. Um, but thinking back to that case that I see quite frequently, this has impacted my whole understanding and shifted the paradigm around chronic pain. I found in the last few weeks that I've been working on this, I'm asking myself more questions, like where is the source of this patient's pain? Is it peripheral or is it central? Why are they suffering from it? Because pain and suffering are not necessarily the same. And how might my efforts to help cause more harm related to pain beliefs. I think one of the most wonderful things about our job is to feel that we're relieving pain. Um, 
And I recognize that as a, a driver for my own professional behaviors and actions. Um, I wonder now though, for a patient with chronic pain, when I'm writing a prescription for Tylenol, is that actually gonna help the patient's pain or am I reinforcing a belief that the pain is coming from their body? The same with ordering an X-ray or an MRI, is, is that gonna change my management truly or am I just reinforcing their belief that they're, they're bought, something is wrong in their body? So I think that uh, there's a, the pain reprocessing therapy is very promising for the geriatric population. First though, we would need to see these uh, findings reproduced in a wider patient population. This group was highly selected, very motivated. I'd like to see a study of PRT and cognitive impairment because those pathways may uh, be impacted by the pathology. And I'd like to see PRT studied more broadly in older adults in community and long-term care settings because we know that our pain transmission is affected by the aging process. I'd also like to see pain reprocessing therapy uh, studied in a head-to-head -head trial against cognitive behavioral therapy. That's really the mainstay of our psychological treatments for, cog uh, for chronic pain at the moment. And also versus ACT therapy, which was a uh, therapy that I'm not as familiar with and just learned about. But since it's in the NICE guidelines, it would be nice to see those all compared to each other. And that is really the end of my presentation. I welcome any questions or comments. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Uh, I echo Katrina's applause in the uh, um, uh, icon. Wonderful presentation, particularly um, enjoyed the applicability and the clinical relevance that you presented in the last few slides. Uh, that was uh, very well done. I will open it to questions to the audience. I have a question or two, but first uh, I will open it to the audience and Katrina in the chat, uh, says, can you please send me that quote that you read about brains misinterpreting pain signals and it's just a gentle stretch? Question mark, uh, happy face uh, symbol. Thank you, uh, Katrina. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Please feel free to unmute or uh, raise your hand. Uh, John, Dr. Murata has his hand up. Please go ahead, unmute. Um, no, thank, thank you, Rachel. It's um, really amazingly well covered. Uh, such a huge area. I'm fortunate, as uh, some of you know, to work with um, Andrew Ferland, the academic pain group, and actually to have um, supervised her a bit as a geriatrician back early on when she was a fellow. So um, there's so much that's not been done in the 70 plus age group, uh, those of the, the fellows who are interested in this, um, we do have um, the academic clinic for the elderly. We run that twice a month at Toronto Rehab, um, the University Avenue site. And um, most definitely I'll be bringing this back to the group because the literature in 70 plus is really um, uh, almost non-existent. Um, and uh, the approach here, um, uh, the teaching, coping, um, having people reframe um, what pain means to them um, in our clinical work with them has made a real difference to see this validated in a proper study um, is so reassuring. And we spent the last three, four years getting people off opioids, off um, a number of other analgesics, but there's so much that uh, needs to be done. Uh, so um, this is a fantastic, uh, no, no question here. There's so many questions that need to be answered. Um, so um, uh, well done again, thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. I might offer that uh, perhaps you were a little bit more generous than I would have been in the first part of the critical appraisal, uh, particularly with uh, were the groups balanced at the start. And I think that the um, pain reprocessing therapy group had significantly more patients treated with opioids 
And I think your comment, the question, analgesia question mark is very important, mm -hmm. that the other medications, antidepressants, as you mentioned, the patient population suffered uh, a relatively high burden of emotional distress. And so lack of reporting on those medications and the balance between small groups um, is a limitation to me. And the other thing I was very surprised at was uh, how greatly sustained the, the, the difference was over a year. And so the, the reason that was surprising to me, uh, I always wonder about the control group, how appropriate a, con a control group is to educational videos as opposed to eight hours of therapy. And so you wonder if it's the specific element of the therapy or simply the exposure uh, to eight hours of interaction compared to you know, the videos. I'm not sure how long those videos were, uh, but uh, so, so uh, you know, those two things were uh, limitations that maybe uh, my um, red uh, X may have been a little bit more pronounced than the uh, a green check, but, uh, but just one person's perspective. Yeah, that's a very fair point. I took the, even the sustained response in the usual care group, to indicate that this patient population was was so motivated and educated and they were so active that maybe it was a bit of a self-selecting group uh, to start with. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we're three minutes to the hour. Um, uh, some great comments in the chat box. Patricia, Thiru, uh, and again, Katrina, uh, all echo uh, two wonderful uh, presentations. And uh, we see that every month, the, the level and um, quality of our presentations are just phenomenal. So thank you both, Ramiz and Rachel, uh, this morning. Uh, Sharon and Barb uh, also express uh, the same. I want to remind everyone uh, to complete the evaluations. Uh, you should have received an email about one or two minutes ago with the evaluations for these two presentations. And thank you 